Michael, welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, to the fourth Antonio Talks talk show. Today, I have a guest on my show, as I do every week. Uh, today's guest is a person that's very close to my heart. The person that, well, one of the people that enabled recruited to happen in many ways. Well, in in your in your funding ways, <laughs> um, James Ballard, ladies and gentlemen. Let's Hello. give him a clap. Let's give him a clap. James, how are you? <laughs> Very well, thanks, Antonio. Good, good. How are you? Yeah, really well. Yeah. Really well. How did you? How, how's, how was your journey into the office? Slippery. Slippery. But, I know. But, it's snow, but snow, we made it. it. Yeah. Exactly. The east. No, the beast from the east <laughs> beast didn't get you. No. No, that's it. Not yet. I know. That's <laughs> still going home, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Also, it depends when we meet at <laughs> right. Um, anyway, <laughs> so James, how are? How is everything? Yeah, pretty good, mate. Pretty good. So Working last time hard. we did a co- we did this type of we did, and I burst into laughter last time. I know. So I know. We've got we've got, we've got quite a good energy <laughs> that, that goes so. between us, right? Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, but the last time we did the, uh, something like this, yeah. it was in a. You were a baby. Very, I was a baby. You were like a week old or something yeah. as a business. As or a business, like that. that's yeah. it. It's a very in a very different setting too. Yeah, you know, that's we right. Didn't have microphones in our faces. I know. You know, we didn't have lights on us. No, we had two cameras though. Granted, but we didn't have. This type of equipment, which is nice, is great. Yeah, it is, it's good. It's really good. And uh, obviously, I mean, maybe these microphones aren't the best quality, but it looks good. So. <laughs> Masks out the faces, which is good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. So, Jace, thanks very, very much for coming on the show. Um, I was going to talk spe- specifically around GD- about GDPR with you. Yeah. But to be honest, it is quite a dry topic. So, I, I'd actually let's make like, it exciting. Yeah, exactly. Let's make it exciting. I'd like to speak a bit more around. Um, obviously recruitment mm. as you know it you know you're a very successful recruitment director um, you know obviously you've got a, a, a very successful uh, network as well which is or, or I guess community mm. which is the business transformation network yeah um, and I think I really value your opinion in terms of like foresight for the industry mm. where you think it's going to go so mm. let's just have a real cool conversation around all this sort of stuff yeah. and but actually, prior to that, let's talk uh, about you. Tell us about yourself. Tell us your story. Why? Well, how did James get here from birth? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know? Everything. Everything. Tell us. What is your Mate, story, um, James? You want to know? Uh, so I've been recruiting forever. Yeah. From a like work point of view. I started in like 2000. Met a recruit. Classic. Didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm. You know this story, right? Do you know this story? I know this story, but tell it again because these people. Two thousand so year two thousand. My audience don't know the year story. Year two thousand. The heyday of recruitment. Bur- burst into sort of like the work scene, thinking, "What the hell do I do?" Mm. Met this recruitment consultant, said, "Do you like meeting, representing people? Do you want to earn money?" And I was like, "Yeah, sounds great." Obviously, didn't know what I wanted to do. Had just finished the student union's like sabbatical year, um, and just thought it'd be a stopgap, and started a big sort of FTSE two fifty recruitment company. Uh, found it pretty tough, but there was something about recruitment that's pretty addictive. Mm. And I was just saying the other day, there's not many industries where you feel you can make like major impact. Yeah. Not just like building your own business, but actually doing something positive for people, but also positive for industry. Mm. I mean, the stuff that like you're doing, others are doing, genuinely could be changing the recruitment world. Mm, How right. many other industries could you be like in your twenties, thirties, whatever it yeah. might be, and actually change an industry sector. I know. It's because, what, 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 because what, what, we're quite what a young industry, aren't we? We're quite young. Well it's just right for this. Do you think it's the Wild well? West? Do you think like the, the industry is still the Wild West? And I don't mean that in terms of let's get to the cowboys in the industry later on, but I don't mean that. What I mean is is that, you know, we in the Wild West, you know, people just they, they created the towns because there was no towns. Yeah. They created businesses because there was no businesses there so do you feel like uh recruitment is actually rife for that type of or do you think this industry because it's so young in many ways how old is this industry well some would say it's the oldest profession to be honest but but we won't go down probably professionally sort of 50 60 years old yeah you know the big sort of recruitment companies that came in i would say um but yeah i think in some ways you could sort of say it's like wild west like i think it's almost like you know in inception yeah. Where, like, you've got, like, that world, and it's sort of after the world, sort of, like, something else is starting. Yeah. Because there's something being built. There's all these buildings and skyscrapers around, but some of them might need to come down. Yeah. And who knows what comes after. Mm. So it's almost like post-apocalyptic. I think that the next five, ten years, all sorts of stuff could happen in the industry. You know, you've got the likes of Google Hire coming in. You've got LinkedIn, Microsoft purchase, everything happening with AI. Mm. I mean, you'd be a brave man to predict what's going to happen. 
Yeah, well, you, and you've got a, a major app coming soon, Recruited, haven't you? So Apparently so, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so let's talk about when you started in recruitment. Two, yeah. Year 2000. Yeah. Year, you know, you had the, the, your, your life in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so talk, tell me a bit more about sort of like what the culture was like back then. Because do you feel Maybe. like because obviously your your, your directors mm. or your CEOs are probably retired now, right? At that time, those people they, they haven't actually really. You know, one of one of my um, directors is probably one of the people I most look up to in the industry. Yeah. This guy called Gary Eldon, who's okay. now the, the CEO, the chief executive of S3, is amazing person. At the time, he was like the director of Huxley, so brand within a brand. Mm. Um, but no, most of them are still going actually. Um, but, you know, and I don't really want to talk too much about S3 because S3 was an amazing sort of place for me. But I think the industry has changed. I but I, I want to talk about S3, actually, because yeah. um, I think that a lot of amazing people have come out of yeah. S3. All yeah. the, pretty much a lot of the major recruitment companies. Like you could probably name 20 yeah, at least. Exactly. Why is that? Why, because how did they this grew, create they, this beast? Look, they, grew people, they grew people organically. Yeah. So they knew what good recruitment was in terms mm. of like delivery. Mm. Um, I've almost, this is going to sound harsh if anybody from SP is watching, I've almost likened it to uh, previously typed Terminator. Mm. So if you imagine they're like, you know, they've got the fiery eyes and they've got the machine, you know, it's deadly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it probably wasn't at that point the most finesse service led recruitment yeah. that you would see but compared to other businesses of that time maybe they were mm. because when i started there was all sorts of things mm. and stories i'd hear about other recruitment companies and about how candidates would be sort of treated and yeah things that would happen in the industry i'd like to think that's changed yeah i, I think, think we're in a professional world now you've to got be honest, to be good to be able to survive and absolutely to absolutely and i think that's another thing is that you know being from the industry myself being coming, but well, being in the recruitment agency world, being in uh, internal world, I've found that actually there are more good recruiters than there are bad, I, and a absolutely there are way more good recruiters. Now, I, I this what I want to talk about really the the negative of the industry because we're not here to talk about it, but I do want to talk about the fact that in year two thousand, how different was it? How different was a recruitment agency culture to what you've created at Annapurna, for instance? Um, well. And, I can't really talk for many other agencies because obviously I really only ever worked at two. Um, but I think that what we do at Annapurna is slightly different to what we did at S3 in terms of this community sort of based approach that we've created. And mm. I think that S3's model, uh, although they've probably evolved, is probably still 99% of recruitment firms. Yeah. You know, 99% of people are still have certain metrics that they're measuring people against, which is mm. like how many CVs can you get out? Mm. Um, how many people can you sort of speak to on a daily basis? It's all, they used to use the adage of recruitment's a contact sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which it is, to be fair. Yeah, you know, you've got course. to go out and meet people. Well, it but is. I, I do think it's all about relationships. You know, so the way that I see things is it's like, um, whereas a lot of people would see it as a transactional yeah. sort of like industry, for me, it's about everybody's like a hub. Like if I looked at you, growing off you is like a network. Mm. So you know who the best people are you've ever worked with. Yeah. You know, you know who the best bosses are you've ever worked with. And you're going to hopefully help me to tell me and build the relationships with those people yeah. if I look after you. Yeah. So if I don't, like, I, I if wanna... I don't, then you won't. Like you know people at Accenture. Yeah. yeah? They were probably people that might hire yeah. or they're good like recruiters if I recruit for recruiters. Yeah. You could introduce me to them if I look after you mm. as a candidate. So that's that's always how I've I've tried to build my sort of network. Let's go backwards on that because I wanna yeah, I try to do it. There's a there's a there's a, there's a, so there's a community based approach, I right? Understand, but which a lot of recruitment firms have tried to do, mm. but it's a gimmick. They but don't, I want to they talk about, I want to highlight your don't. transactional piece. Yeah. And this is great because we've got good conversation going on and we love to flow this sort of stuff. So I want to highlight, highlight your transactional piece. Yeah. Because there is a perception out there from the professional world and even from, and in, uh, you know, yeah, from the professional world that recruiters are too transactional. Yeah. But I disagree because how, you know, the, Yes, you are transactional to an extent because at the end of the day, life is a transaction. So, you know, sort of ba business is based on transactions. But, you know, what about the time that you've spent maybe 16 months building a relationship with a candidate and then 16 months later, there's the perfect job that you know that they, they're right for. Mm. So that, that's not transactional. That's actually 16 months just checking in with someone, seeing how they're doing, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then 16, you know, 16 months later, because there's a job that's perfect for them, you knew that that person. But do you think most recruitment firms are actually doing that? I think so. Do you? I absolutely do. I think the best ones are. I don't think the best ones are. I, I, you know, where, but what, what, to what extent? That's what they should be doing yeah. completely. Are they doing it? I don't know. 
But to what extent can yeah, you do it? How many recruiters how... stay longer than 16 months in recruitment? You know, on average. Well, probably... I don't know. You know that. You... I, well, I don't know that, but I'd suggest probably, probably I'd, I'd guess about 30, 40%. There's, so, a lot of, there's a lot of churn in yeah. recruitment firms still, you know, because they, they tend to hire younger people, first job, think they want to do recruitment, mm. as everybody sort of thinks they do, and maybe don't. Yeah. Um, and most cultures are still what they were, so they're still driving people to do a certain volume of calls, of metric-based stuff, yeah. treating it as almost like a pure sales job. Yeah. And because of that, people churn through people. Yeah, I so, so. I, I, I don't know. I, look, I completely agree with you. I think that's the right way to do recruitment, and that, that is value-add. Yeah. You know, especially in niche professional services markets, you know, where my biggest comp- competition I've always seen is not my other agencies that are in mm. our space. Mm. That is not our competition. Mm. No, it's not. not. No, our competition is you. Mm. You know, it's it, as in Accenture. Oh, you know, or I'm not Accenture. You. No, but, but I was like, Fuck, I'm looking James? at you like an anchor. James, you invested in us. Why would you invest in your competition? <laughs> But like an Accenture or even recruited potentially an app that comes along, maybe, yeah? yeah? Although I know that you're but helping agencies. I yeah, know, I know. But look, look, James, look. you're saying all the wrong <laughs> things here to the cameras. If, if this gets out... I'm by, re- by recruited. <laughs> no. but, but what I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is like the end client can find their own people, right? Yeah. Yeah? So if they're going to come to an agency, you've got to be the best at what you do. Yeah, Because they're course. probably only going to come to one or two because the future is search. The future is like using people that can find people you can't find very easily very mm. quickly maybe you're already sort of like in a job you can't activate them very easily mm. so you go to a search firm so future search at all levels yeah so let's and it, even can it, I does, just, it doesn't can have I pause to be head off can i pause you on that because i want to get in jump in there so that so that i think you're right thank you that and, and good to know the future is search yes because so there's a massive skills gap coming isn't there well, there's a massive skills gap anyway, and obviously the clients that we work with, they have this they face this skills gap. So, who I don't think internal teams yeah. are as 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 well as they do. I don't think they're equipped enough, and also they don't have no. the time enough no. to be able to find these people. No, no. Or, or agencies. Most agencies are not search consultants at the moment. Mm. They're they're transactional recruiters. Mm. So that's what we've tried to build is build. Uh, a company that can headhunt and can build relationships and use a community to be able to attract companies mm. that want to do search. And I tell you what, it's so much easier than it was even like a year, two years ago to do search because everybody's becoming available. We know where everybody is. Where are they, James? They're all social. Social media, well, absolutely. They're all social. You can see who they are, but who can activate them? Mm. Who's got the capability to build that relationship? Mm. That's the person that you want to be dealing with. So do you feel like, you know, to in order to get this level of um level of search or the search recruiter yes yeah. to create the perfect search recruiter yeah how does that come about is it brand. culture is it is brand it... so this is where you're onto a winner right because you don't just like we well, could you could get lucky and tap somebody on the shoulder and say hey guess what i've got i've got a job for you and it, te- it happens to be the moment that they're looking for a role mm. but typically not what you need to be is the person that over time builds brand consciousness mm. with that individual so when they do come to look for a job or when they come to hire, they think of you, yeah, which of is where we built the BTN and to build it. content that we're continuously hitting them with. Think about it. It's a really crass analogy, but like you've, you've eaten pizza before, right? Yeah. yeah. So when you go for pizza, you probably go for Domino's, I probably would, or Papa John. Or I was thinking about this go, this morning. You go into the flyer desk and you're like, oh, look, this little like, little guy down the road sent me a flyer. I want a pizza. I'll go and call him up. But they're so not so- that usually that good, are they, those geezers down the road? Well, I'm not fussy, so I'll take anything. But I go, I give them a chance. Yeah. Right. So this is the point, right? They built, they've, they've positioned themselves at a point when I'm looking that I go for them just by being in consciousness. So yeah. Well, I think also, so I think, so there's a level of that, and but there's a, so yeah, you can have. So this is great. Let me just reverse. So social absolutely and, and that's music to my ears because you know what we're doing we are all about activating brands continuously putting yeah. them in front of people so that as you said when people are looking to make that transaction they they do it yeah and the transaction is all is tra- it's okay for a professional or your consumer to be transactional because mm. that's they pay you or you get paid for doing that mm. but it's not okay for recruitment agencies to be to be transactional is that what you're saying well, they can be, but I don't think they'll do very well into the future because, let's face it, any company can do that themselves. Mm. They yeah. could post an advert. They can have a database. Absolutely. 
So I want to talk about this search piece because I've never, I've actually, obviously I know what a search is, you know, and my, when you, when you say to me, oh, creating a search firm, mm. it, it, it or what I get in my head is really stuffy guys in suits who are executive search guys. Yeah. Right. That's, I don't get, I don't, I'd say that it's great that they're building that, that um, relationship, but I don't get what, uh, in my mind, I don't see a recruitment agency like Annapurna like mm. that. Mm. So you're in. This is why I speak opportunity, right? Because mm. I think it's like the last bastion that's like not being touched yet. Mm. There's all these search firms work exactly the same way that they always have done, and they don't really do search. Mm. You know, they don't really headhunt extensively through a market. Mm. They're not connecting, you know, brand with the consciousness of that industry sector. Yeah. They're probably relying off a relationship with a very mm. senior person who then comes to them. And I mean, they, they still they, react to anyway. And then they use that name, yeah. you know, to then to go to market. They charge a fortune and not flexible, you know. And so that's a massive opportunity for yeah. people like us, I think. So you creating search, this, this, and I think we may maybe need to recoin this phrase, but I think you, you creating this um, search, uh, sorry, my missus is calling, you creating this search culture. So how do you get your, your, your consultants to be that good? Like, how do you get them? So, because I, I, when I, I, so just for the audience's um, benefit, mm. I, when I first started recruited, uh, James offered me, uh, well, actually, and the Annapurna uh, director, so thank you for that, and I want to give you guys a shout out for that, offered me the uh, their space, you know, to work out of whilst I, I was just finding my feet, and now we're in this great office, so, you know, thanks, thanks for that. Pers- personally, I just want to shout out to you guys at Annapurna saying thanks for that. When I was in your office, I noticed that there's a massive, well, you've got a, a, a training room mm-hmm. and there's a massive emphasis on that training. Yeah. And I was really impressed with this because I hadn't seen that in a recruitment agency. Really? No, I hadn't, I, I, I hadn't seen that sort of level of focus on training in a recruitment agency. Yeah. Um, and I'd liken it to, the, the, the only time I saw it in my career was actually at Apple, the level of, the level of training you guys were providing. We do, put, we do give a lot of training, to be fair. Mm. And it's crucial, right? Because our biggest assets are our people. And, and I say this a lot, you know, I think you can teach anybody how to recruit because if you, you know, obviously we know what we're trying to teach, but we can't teach his heart. Mm. Yeah. You can't teach somebody to want to do it and to be the sort of person you need to do it properly. So like, if you look at um, Starbucks, Pret, you know, they hire people that can smile and like yeah. smiling. Yeah, yeah. They don't hire people that are grumpy. Because naturally, they need to be pro- provide excellent customer service. Dylan used to work at Starbucks. Come I here, Dylan. Come here. That's why you're not working anymore. No, he's not working there <laughs> because I got him out. I got him out of the slums. Got me out. <laughs> um, so, Dylan, tell us about the Starbucks culture. What was it like? Is, is, that, is, that, re- is that actually reflective of the culture at Starbucks? Yeah, no, I think so, yeah. I mean, they, they do hire people that smile. That's, uh, and their application is kind of built around that, that they, they narrow those people down by the words they use, like positive, positive energy. Yeah, of course, energy, caring. You know, you can't teach that. You either are that sort of person or you're not. Yeah, and then yeah, I think exactly. the, the other thing about search is that, you know, you are going to be facing off against some quite senior people. You've got to have a certain level of, level of credibility. Mm. I mean, you know, um, shout out if he's listening. We just hired a guy from PwC. Yeah. You know, he's... What, like, an actual consultant? Yeah. Great. Yeah. To do To do search. You know, he speaks four languages. Wow. He's like um, pretty, you know, pretty senior level there. Qualified lawyer. Mm. But wants to be entrepreneurial and you know we can give him we hope an opportunity to build something out internationally which is really exciting yeah um and search fees you know can be a lot of money no of course they can i um, mean we would we probably we, we'd hope that we'd, we'd be sort of cost effective for any agency but for any incline but i mean still you know a lot of money okay. like a lot of money so you think the future of recruitment is going into this real high touch um level of uh, service do you H- think has to yeah so do you think in, in, from an agency point of view yeah so how important is technology to your company too so like are you incorpor- how important do you think technology is for the um for the employer for of your service or they, do they just want your ability to search well it's interesting i was talking to a very senior person who we took for lunch the other day um he's the md of a, ma- a major drinks company actually Um, yeah and he was like saying so how do you add value Mm. you know what do you do and we talked to him about what we do through the BTN you know as a Mm. branding tool um, about the sort of stuff we can deliver it has Mm. its own job board we can do content we do events for people and he was like yeah I get that that is value add Um, but I think there's much more we could be doing you know I mean there's another company out there called Predictive Hire 
you met them, didn't you, at one yeah. of our events. I mean, you know, AI is coming. Mm. You might be able in two years' time to instantly predict if a candidate's going to work out or not mm. to some reasonable degree of success. That's game changer. Mm. You know, so I think assessment has to be built into the recruitment agency's toolkit into the future. It's something that we're looking at. We haven't got that capability yet, being honest. Yeah, of course. You know, we'd have to work with a partner like a predictive hire or whoever it might be. Yeah. Um, you know, the video stuff that, you know, that we're really passionate about. Mm. You know, companies like Hinterview coming in and, you know, they've. we actually had a really good year last year, partially because we've got video technology. We can do, now in, we can do international searches now or yeah. even roles in Manchester. Yeah. You know, if we're based in London, last year you like, so, okay, we can't meet people in Manchester very easily. Yeah. But now we can create video shortlists. Yeah, so so what's the benefit of using a video platform dedicated to interviewing rather mm-hmm. than just using Skype? Like, Why would I use a, a video Just platform? better. There you go, done. Now, but it's, it's got functionality for recruitment that Skype mm-hmm. doesn't have. So you can record and share all the videos. Mm-hmm. You can create bespoke questions from the client and start and stop questions at specific mm-hmm. times. You know, you can use like you've got like little functions to do. It's just a lot video easier pre- to use, basically. It's for hiring. It's a recruitment. T- it's yeah. a recruitment tool, Great. right? And it's built and so, for recruiters. So your clients, how how much are they responding to video? Are they they, they respond to video? It completely much better, varies. Right? Really? Yeah. Some clients absolutely love it. I could give you an example of a company in Australia that we were working with. Um, we did like a HR search for them, and they loved it so much that they used it for their own internal CEO search. Wow. You know, they thought it was that good. Because they've got stakeholders in Australia, they've got people in Europe, they've got people in America, mm. um, and they can't meet the candidates, yeah. right? You think about people using phone interviews as a pre-screening tool. Well, if you've got video, you don't need to do a phone interview. Yeah. Get recorded video, shows you instantly what culture fit would be like. Mm. Now, there are question marks. People say to me, well, what does that mean in terms of like, um, doesn't that mean that you're biasing against people? Because I can see them on the video. Yeah. I can see, you know, how old they are or... Um, certain other things that you might then um, sort of like disc- de- pro- you know discriminate against yeah. and people are moving again, a- away from that so they'll take names off CV and unconscious bias and mm. all those sorts of things so that is you know that is something that needs to be mm. thought about my, my answer to that would be well they're going to have to come and interview for you sooner or later anyway yeah, and you're going to make you're going to make those sort of if you are going to bias against something that's going to happen so yeah. I think that's it I think um, yeah, but, there always has to look. I, I, I've for I, me, sorry, I let you, sorry, I don't mean to. So, uh, so for me, right, um, you know, that person that let's say they're coming back into work for the first time in five years, they've had a baby, or they're seen as too senior, or they've got no industry experience or too much industry experience. The moment they're not getting an interview, mm. whereas what we're doing is giving them the opportunity to be able to say, you know what, I'm really good for this job, and be able to say that directly to the employer which at the yeah. moment they can't do. Do you think unconscious bias is alive then in people? Yeah, of course it is. Do you think so? Yeah, of course it is. In what ways? Tell, well, like, tell look, me a bit more. I'm sure when we walk in this room, you guys probably have a look at me and, you know, you think I'm a certain age, you think I'm a certain this, certain... You just do. You just you just do, right? Everybody naturally forms unconscious bias. Mm. They, fit, they, make, they make assumptions about people. Yeah. That's how your brain is wired. It's natural to do that. Yeah, to, it's to, wrong to say that you yeah. don't assume instantly. To categorise people, right? You'd say, you know, if I asked you what sort of music do I like, you know, you're probably not going to say um, Wu-Tang Clan or, yeah. you know, or whatever. You're going to say rock music. Or yeah. so, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's just we naturally do this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it does exist. Um, uh, but I don't think, you know, I don't think video is... Is a, is a medium that makes that more prevalent. Mm. You know, if anything, I think it gives people more opportunity because the other thing is, right, is that I think candidates feel lost. Mm. Like in what ways? Well, look, if you think about it, how many different sources are there now of channels to jobs? Yeah. There's thousands. And how many, well, and, and all these direct clients that are trying to advertise and find people. Now, if you're a job seeker, how do you know how to deal with that? Well, how, this how is, do you know where to go? How do you know? This is exactly how to, it. This it's is not part just a of the CV reason. anymore. You're applying through different things in different ways. They don't know how to do it, and yet the recruitment agency doesn't get paid mm. for helping a candidate. Now, if recruitment agencies didn't exist, how would candidates get any sort of advice about yeah, how to like? Comes, yeah, exactly. Where does it come from? It doesn't come from the government. So no, this is nobody's exactly, helping. This them. is exactly where we're at. I think the. the you ask any professional out there, they hate searching for a job. Like it's 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 not an enjoyable it's, it's, experience. No, it's not. It's and also there's there's not it's there's too many processes, there's too many systems 
And most of the systems are there to um, perpetuate the status quo. And the black holes, you don't so, get any feedback, exactly, there's no accountability. Exactly. So if we have a look at, for instance, if I'm a um, data scientist, yeah. and I want to go and find companies that hire for Python, R, SAS, MATLAB, whatever it is, the data science um, technologies, yeah. how would I go and do that? Well, I'm going to plug myself right now. <laughs> in, I know what you're doing in the future. <laughs> In the future, in a very next short month, future, yeah. yeah, exactly. You'll be able to put all these skills in. You'll get recommended recruitment agencies that hire for your skills, mm. and you get recommended employers that hire for your skills too. Yeah. Similarly, you know, and I think it's both things. The only reason that there's so much friction in our industry is because people have a very, a very difficult time discovering each other. And I don't mean just people, not just professionals, but I mean employers, agencies, and professionals discovering each other. Mm. They have a very difficult time qualifying each other. Yep. You know, and we're talking about video, but still, that I'm not talking about that assessment stage yet. I'm talking about just qualifying Everything. whether I'm going to shortlist you. Of course. And then also the transactional side, just applying for a job can be such an arduous process. Mm. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. So... If we're talking about the future of recruitment mm. and how candidates feel lost, what? And I'm not. I'm not asking to plug recruited. I'm just actually asking. In your expertise, you've been in the industry a long time, and your dedication to candidate experience is is, is unrivaled. I, you know, I know that you guys are amazing at it. What do you feel like candidates need from recruitment agencies in order to uh, make them trust recruitment agencies again? Um. Well, it's about the individual recruitment consultant actually caring. So this notion mm. of hiring people that smile, you need to hire people that actually care about calling somebody back mm. and looking after them. But I don't, you know, although recruitment agencies are part of the issue and the answer, the biggest issue is there needs to be some sort of central way of getting careers and employment advice, which is maybe something you guys can really help with as well. Mm. Just like some sort of central repository of like, this is how I write a CV. This is how I go do an interview. Like I know that if I searched it on YouTube, I did the other a couple of years ago, like how to write a CV. There was some agency out there that had done a video and it had over like a million watches. Mm. No disrespect to that agency, I won't name it, but it wasn't like some sophisticated tool to help them. It was just no. some basic guidelines. That was about the only thing there was. So do you point. feel like candidates just aren't equipped enough? So no, like, do you feel like so yeah, just people aren't equipped and enough to, not to write about themselves. Nobody knows. Like the the whole population of the UK basically could be trained to to uh, look for a job. Let's ask these guys. Do you feel like you know how to write a CV, Dylan? No. Why? Well, I've already got it written. But like, how long did it take you to write your CV? Hours. Did anybody help you? Uh, no, but um, where did you know where where online. where would you have gone to find like so how to write it? Google. So if you guys, yeah. if you guys out there and you're a recruitment agency or you're an employer and you want to get traffic to your site immediately, I'd write the best article on how to write a CV um, because that will appear on Google search and obviously the weighted, how weighted it is, um, will determine where where it appears and what number it does. But yeah, actually, that's right. All going to Cora because Cora is a massive place for that too. So there was another site that used to exist called Plotter. You ever heard of that? So, like, career, you know, there used to be career sites at universities and at schools and things like that, and they're basically all gone. So there's no career centres anymore in the way that there were in education provision. And there was this, like, website, great idea, it was government-funded, that was going to be, like, a world for companies, you know, like, big corporates to say why they come and work there, but also to communicate with with people that might be interest, interest, interested in certain industries and skill sets. Mm. Like, let's say, you know, there's a shortage of girls going into maths. Yeah. You know, so it's about articulating why maths and science is a good thing to do. And, and then there'd be some content or ed educational stuff. Unfortunately, it went. It got put. It got pulled down, mm. and, and and that was meant to be the answer. It's gone. So nothing. As far as I can see, mm. there is nothing there. So let's moment. go into no, this because no, this is really, really great. And obviously, it's like two white males talking about diversity. But how diverse do you think um, our professional services or professional world is? In what way? So it's in, in, in every way. I mean, it doesn't just need to be sort of, you know, male, female, black, white, whatever it is. Um, all I'm saying is how diverse do you think, um, you know, the middle and middle management and senior end of um, professional services are? Well, you know, we all know what the, the stats about people trying to improve, improve inclusion and diversity. So, mm. you know, the, the, ev the evidence says not that diverse and yeah. struggling yeah. to change it because it's not... 
about um, the effect. It's about the problem. It's about yeah. catching people at early stage mm. and you know changing hearts and minds. Mm. So I think companies actually often do quite a good job you know, in terms of making sure that they enable anybody to come into that process. But the diversity isn't in that application process. Mm. So from a recruitment agency point of view, how, or from a recruitment world, maybe not a recruitment agency, I want to talk this as a broader, from a recruitment world, from recruitment professionals, how can we impact this? How can we, how can we drive this um, to become, I guess, more of an equal uh, workplace? Well, you know, the things that you and I do around content is important mm. because you could create a video podcast that can communicate with people instantly yeah. and it's global. I think every recruitment agency can do that now and should be doing with that. Um, you know, the certain sectors that you deal with, working with clients to look at things like um, apprenticeships and early early access schemes is something that people can do. Mm. Local communities that we all, all work in. You know, we had a, a couple of years ago, I had somebody come in from a local school you know, who's from a non-traditional background to be a recruitment consultant. I don't see many other agencies doing that. No. You know, giving work experience to people. Um, it's not just agencies. It's the whole sort of population of industry mm. could be doing more. But there's no there's no ownership. There's no real central advice. There's mm. no... Nobody's pushing it. Yeah. And nobody really... Everybody talks about it, but nobody really knows what to do. And I've done events on this mm. with resourcing... <laughs> Just cut, sorry, just broke my chair. I've done, <laughs> done events with resourcing leaders and they're yeah. all really passionate about it. But again, you know, they talk about doing stuff, but it mm. involves changing society. Yeah, And that's course. something that if that's you're it. a big retailer, you can't do that no. on your own. That's it. Um, and and do, do you think there's a there's an element of, you know, hire, that that hiring the best person for the job is the is, is is what everyone should be doing or do you think actually you know from the opposite side should we be hiring a more diverse workforce but I, I i personally right and you rightly or wrongly i always think you should hire the best person for the job mm. I, I had an example recently where i won't say who but a client wanted us to uh hire somebody who was specifically wanted us to look predominantly for females mm. for a role and um you know that was hard to do yeah because it felt wrong that we yeah. would have to then not include the men which we did yeah, men. we yeah, showed absolutely. men as well yeah wasn't we could not do that yeah absolutely because uh, i think it is about using you know it is about being equal and it's about look right we we are just here to hire skills that's mm. it that's what recruiters do we hire skills um and it doesn't matter who you are where you're from what your what your sex what your pronoun it's all about can you fulfill this job better than everyone else, mm. and that's how it should For be. For me, education is everything, you know, and mm. about messaging to people early on in their careers or early on in experience what's possible. Yeah, um, and I think there's a lack of that. Mm. You know, there's a lack of leadership. There's a lack of education. Um, lack and of visions. Lack of that's it. Drive maybe this. You know, it just feels like we're living in a bit of a mess. I mean, all this stuff at the moment about universities. Yeah, you know, it's just a mess. I think it's a historic thing too. I think the reason everyone is having, and this is just my opinion, the reason everyone's having such a struggle at the moment, um, and yeah, equality in the workplace is definitely something that needs to be addressed. You know, um, more females, more black leadership, more, um, you know, whatever ethnic minorities on leadership panels needs to be, needs to happen, absolutely. But I think also, as you said, it's a historic thing. And now that we're raising awareness of it, I don't think we can solve that right now mm. because they're just, it, it, it's just, it's just, I don't think it's, it's possible. But mm. I think going forward down the line, I think now that people are talking about this, it's mm. going to be mentioned in schools. It's going to be mentioned in, in these places. And that's well, what's going to create a more You know what, things like AI, line. things like video actually could help. Yeah. Because now it's not just about, this is what I've got on my CV or these are my grades. It's mm. like, here I am. Mm. Here I am. And this is my assessment and my capability. Yeah. You know, I don't have four A's, mm. but, you know, you can see by reading my score that actually I'm going to be brilliant for your company because I didn't have that opportunity that somebody else from a certain background did. Yeah. yeah. But I'm actually brilliant. Yeah. So hopefully things like that will level the playing field. I think that's what it's about. It's about access, isn't it? Yeah. Access. Yeah. Do I have access to it? So let's talk about the BTN. Mm -hmm. This is a transformation network. Yeah. It's a network that is focused on delivering um, value. And that's all you do. Like there is, uh, and the interesting thing about this is that all you guys do on the BTN is deliver value. Mm. And obviously the BTN is, is part of um, 
Uh, well, actually, is it part of Annapurna or is it separate? It's a separate entity now, yeah. yeah. But the vision is to be the world's home for business change. Right. Yeah, because we felt that if we create something like that as a hub, mm. that when companies go to transform or people think about transformation, they look for content, they look for jobs, they look for events, they see that, and then instantly, hopefully, they think of, of us and our partners. Yeah. And it puts us right at the centre yeah. of that ecosystem. When did you start it? When we started the firm. Yeah. So like it was originally the HRTN, so... Um, 2009 so like what was that nine years ago now right. when LinkedIn social was just starting to proliferate people were joining groups mm. and our group went viral Amazing. you know so it got to like 10,000 people and then suddenly every week we'd have like 40, 50, 100 applying that people from all over the world that we didn't know mm. that's the beauty of like yeah. social and you hit them with quality content and then they share that and then how you know, was your how was your group and before we go into this how was your group impacted by LinkedIn's algorithm change now that they well now they're trying to get back to actually prioritising groups again but they stopped putting group, know, yeah. group content in feeds yeah I know yeah so if you're a member awful. of a group so <laughs> wasn't it awful yeah they don't get it I don't exactly. think you know well, I, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, but but now they're actually going. They the op- they're now doing. they're going the I opposite think, side. I think they lost it. But I mean, for me, groups is everything. Yeah. You know, specialist content. It's not about you know my dog got a medal for bravery, gets a thousand likes, or yeah. I've just got a new job and you know. Or an Antonio you know, post. Like. Antonio post. You know, <laughs> delete. <block. laughs> I know he's unfollowed joking, me. I bet joking, he has. Joking, joking. I wonder how many people has unfollowed me. If you've unfollowed me, like this video, and that'll tell me how many people have unfollowed me. Great. I just unfollowed my content. I don't think that'll work. It will work. They won't watch. They won't watch the video. Until no, it's, it. um, it's going to be in your network. Oh, right, be my network. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but they won't follow me now that they've seen them. Yeah, but that's fine. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That you know, it, it, it's it's got to happen. I I'm a, I think that if you uh, like, I I judge my success and how many people hate me too. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, I think it's I think it's important because if how people, successful are you then? Well, I'd, I'd say I'm getting there. I'm not really. Yeah. I'm not really like the way I need to be, but I think I, I don't mean success as in my person success or my company success, but I mean my success online. How much how 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 much reach I have by mm. how many people who hate me? Because yes, there is going to be people who hate what you're saying, and there's going to be people who disagree with it, which most of the time people do with my shit. But there is also the people that just won't even click like, but they go, oh, oh that's, that's nice. And that's that's yeah. a net, that's the power of it. To form opinion to hate something means that you've got to like care about something quite deeply. So there's some sort of connection there. And they say there's a fine lo- fine line between love and hate, don't they? Well, I think so. yeah, I think that's it. And like I never I I never go out of my way to comment negative stuff on other people. I actually go out of my way to comment positive stuff on people's posts because I think there could be more positivity on LinkedIn. What well, like we we spoke about this on the first show with um, Ian that LinkedIn is becoming quite volatile, isn't it? Quite to- it's quite toxic. Yeah. I think it's rubbish. But yeah. I mean, look, I'd be very interested to see how what they do with groups. Groups, p- pushing groups is a good thing. It was hidden away in like that uh, LinkedIn paid for thing mm. down the side on the right. Now apparently they're like refocusing on it. Uh, you know, their, um, their lack of focus on groups has been good for us. Because, yeah, because then now you've managed to... So, yeah, great. Because we've got quality content, right? So, we've uh, got the largest tr- transformational video repository in the world. We've got over 500 videos on our site. So, you fo- so, are you, so your, your platform, talk mm. a bit more about it. So, you, you guys, what have you done? So, you've gotten people to come to this platform and then yeah. you've just given them content every day. Basically, yeah. We've got a new piece of content every day. People process technology, the free themes. We list all of our events, but also partner events that are going mm. on. They're transformational. Um, we've got the only transformational job board. We've got our own little forum, you know, so proper forum, not just like How active like and is comment. It? Well, you know what? <laughs> it's, it's not as active as I would hope it will be um, because I thought it was the right thing to do. So, like, people seem to like and comment on posts, but it's not a real discussion. Mm. Whereas I thought it would be the right thing to have a classic forum where people could actually put down topics that they want to talk about and then people mm. talk about it. But maybe it's because the site's obviously still quite embryonic. Maybe maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe forums are dead. No, I don't think... No, they're not. But it's not that active. But the private fat forums are more active. Yeah. So ones you can't see what's going on, mm. like which is like peer-led, quite senior, quite specialist. People love yeah. those. Yeah, that's it. Um, so let's talk about these events. I've been to a couple of your events. Yeah, I've great. Sat on, sat on the board I'm biased, on, on, but on they are panel. great. I tell you what, I mean, your events, they are fun. Mm. And and they're, they're, they are round tables, so just for the benefit of you guys out there, they're round tables of senior leadership within the talent, change, 
HR space. Mm. Um, but the events there are some interesting conversations, mm. and it's it's like every and they're heated. Inform- they're heated, it's aren't informal. they? Do you not think they're really yeah, heated? That's what I want. You want yeah. people, you know. So we make we, we we invite people who've got an opinion that are leaders in their space. Um, and it's informal, so they know it's like Chatham House. They're not going to get shared in, in externally. And, and we've learned because we used to put on events that were just big events that anybody could come to, mm. and actually learned that like uh, people want a peer network and they want to have like these discussions. So yeah, it works really really well for us. And um, you know, it's something we've we found actually like has commercial value as well. Yeah. You know, if you think about sponsoring a conference where you get your logo mm. effectively behind. You know, somebody's head that doesn't get any ROI. Yeah. People want FaceTime with senior people. Yeah, that's right. You know, and that's, and that's, yeah, what, we, that's what we do. Them, that's it. Okay, great. And so, do you think? So, so what's the plans for the the, B, the BTN then? What What's your plans? Are you gonna um, try and create keep people on your network, or are you gonna move into other people's networks? Well, we're, we're evolving all the time, right? You know, if you said nine years ago that we'd have like our own video platform and. You know all the stuff that we're doing we would have like wow that's great so who knows antonio what the future is but we just want to keep um keep close to what the the original goal was which is like bring people together to share so a couple of things that will happen um the job board's gonna have its own video product soon mm. um so that people can have their own video cvs that's exciting so we give everybody in the world free video profile maybe that's something we can you know do we've recruited yeah there's also gonna be a premium version that yeah. people can export so that's coming. Um, you know, we'd love to do stuff around like online education mm. yeah, because yeah. I think there's a real opportunity there to because cr- we already have 500 videos, you know, that we could have maybe further videos that people or assessment or stuff like that, that people could, we could partner with education providers. Yeah. So like lo- loads of cool stuff, but we just want to make put on this at the moment. The, the immediate goal is as many events as we can, as many people like getting, getting involved and like accessing that content and liking it and building out our own internal team to support that. Uh, but the events are key, the events, are, the events are everything. Great. And what do you think um, is important to employers now? So from a, from a uh, you know, obviously the people you deal with, your target demos, mm. TA directors, right? Mm. What's important to them? What's important to them? What is important, what, what, what's, what, what's, what's worrying them at the moment? Well, all sorts of things. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, a minefield out there, isn't there, with things like GDPR. I'm sure, you know, they're thinking about that a lot. Um, but it's got to be about getting great people as quickly and as cost effectively as possible. And I do think that, um, you know, TA has been put on the pressure over the last 10 years in the wrong way. It's all been about cost of hire. And it's, it's not about cost of hire. Mm. It's about quality of hire. Yeah. Yeah. Would you pay, let's say I could get you an amazing person, salesperson, let's say, or whoever, that's going to make you a million pounds next year. You know, would you pay 10 grand fee for that versus something you can hire directly that's going to make you 500k? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you'd pay 10 grand, but nobody's measuring success on hire like that no, at the moment. So it's all be. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> with that, bang, it's like pennies drop, the signs drop. Exactly. It's because I've moved that. You let me for that. No, but it's true. It's true, right? I think so. And, and this, is the, this is the problem. And, you know, I'm a massive fan, obviously, of agency, but I mean, I use agencies myself. You know, we spent a lot of money last year on agencies, but it's worth every penny if we hire yeah. people that are going to, like, add value and well, that's it. provide And that's why return. we've created Recruited, because we think that we've recruited... We've, we, agencies are the best source for hiring and yeah. job seeking. It's yeah. fundamental that they are. Um, you know, I've been in every part of the um, life cycle. I've been an employer. I've been an agency. I've been a professional. I've been in internal teams. And I know that, you know... It, it doesn't it does agencies are the best that's it it's fundamentally they they just know however however there needs to be some way to interact with these agencies and i don't think there is a place for that at the moment obviously recruiters are launching that but i feel like it's there is there are too many there's too because it's wild west Mm. there's too many um different avenues for people to go down and we need to make sure that it's 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 a place where it is do you actually do you think the recruitment industry should be regulated in what way? It's in, you know, there's professionals who call out there saying, you know, the recruitment, recruitment industry needs to be regulated mm. in terms of, um, I suppose... Well, it is being regulated through GDPR in terms of data. Yeah, access. so let's talk about that because, yes. But, but, my, but look, I think that there should be more accountability. You but know, do you so think, do you think so basically why, there's this like, is, this is why so I like apps to... Co, or for instance, or, or another form of um, board or whatever, that if, 
you know, you if some if a candidate's been uh, like griped, they'd go to uh, some sort of complaints forum, and then they'd raise that. And this forum, if they've been, um, I suppose, harassing, because oh, a lot look. of people would say that they've been harassed by agencies. I don't think so. There's I'm no, just saying. Look, there's no accountability at the moment for agencies mm. or for end clients. You know, I mean, I know because I speak to a lot of people that they feel really disappointed often in the recruitment process because they don't get any feedback. Mm. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that we're perfect, obviously, you know, but most agencies and most end clients are awful yeah. in terms of feedback. Yeah. And, and I know because I speak to a lot of people how dispiriting it is mm. when you're a great person and you just don't get any response. You can't learn. Yeah. You know, um, it, so I think that's one of the reasons why I was keen to sort of partner with you because I knew that you were going to like make accountability absolutely. part of your process absolutely. so that companies and agencies would then be reviewed would then sort of like have be profiled in terms of quality. I think that's really important. That's it. Absolutely. If you look at what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep that those lines of communication going. So even if the candidate isn't right or even if the professional isn't right for a position, mm. that feedback is going straight back to them because mm. it, there's one centralized place. Yeah. The reason that um, I the reason I think that the industry is broken is because we not broken because it's certainly not, it's half a trillion dollar industry. But the reason I feel that the industry is inefficient... Mm, is inefficient, yeah, definitely. Because um, of the fact that it is inefficient and there's not one centralised place for everyone to be in. Yeah. And because... LinkedIn's not that place. Because LinkedIn... No, it. LinkedIn's a professional network. It's a mm. different bag. Yeah, We're talking about careers and yeah, yeah, recruitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the reason why... And we, it's not a recruitment site either, is exactly, it? Exactly, it's not. It's a professional yeah. network. Um, so... So if you had one place where, yeah, you could, you, you, so employers can engage with agencies in the same level they engage with you, your mm. agency. Yeah. Agencies can engage with, with professionals in the same way you do right now, mm. but it's all in one place where it's a bit more transparent. It's less, it's less, there's less friction. It's one place. Mm. I think that that's, that's the uh, way forward. And my goal, you know, as you know, is to make sure that agencies are repositioned as the mm. best source for hiring. Look, if I was a candidate and I thought, right, I'm going to be able to find instantly what all the jobs are out there and who the best people are mm. with reviews, I'd go to that site. Yeah. And that's not LinkedIn. No, it's not. It's at the not. moment. I mean, maybe they're trying to evolve what they are, but, you know, it was never meant to be a recruitment site. Mm. They just turned towards recruitment because they saw they were making money out of it. So yeah. it's never been built as a pure recruitment um, avenues. So well, it's the it's, bulk so of it's, their business is like broken, right? It, and, and they're trying to like the only reason why they're trying to change is because they want to make money, yeah, not because right. they believe it's the the right thing to do from a candidate experience point yeah, of view. It's just they're trying it. to do whatever makes them cash at the end of the day. No disrespect to like any LinkedIn people that listen. No, to this, not at all. Not at all. I think that's true. I think, and, so and too. also there's such a big organisation now. It's very difficult for them to be agile and move. Yeah. You know, like this the video profiles. They should have had that years ago. How they haven't got video profiles on the on LinkedIn is the, there's something strange going on there. Well, they, I, I, I've, so this is all just um, speculation. Um, just FYI to everyone out there, um, but. I think from my perspective, when you grow so fast, and they've done a great job of doing that, growing so fast, I think that, and you don't build a structure in where it's like in every department, it's all about how do we create the best product. Mm. You know, that that's what happens. But I think all of these areas are siloed. So I've heard from people that they are siloed, that feed is, is yeah, different course. to, uh, because everyone owns but different huge. units. Huge. So it's difficult to be sort of like um, effective from that perspective. Quick point about GDPR, not wanting to be too boring. Now let's talk about but, GDPR. Yeah, regulation-wise. So I think it could have a big, big impact. Everybody's thinking about GDPR. Mm. Nobody I've talked to seems to have like 100% know what the answer is in terms of what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. But what people haven't talked about is what the impact of it might be. Yeah. And, and I, think it, I think it could be a big opportunity for people like us, agencies anyway. Yeah. Because, right... What it means, as far as I can see, and I'm not an expert, is that for you to be on some of these database to move forward, you have to give consent. Mm. And that consent will drop after period, and then you have to reapply for that consent. Now, that instantly means that a lot of people aren't going to give consent. Because you don't want to be held on databases, do you? No. Yeah? So that's not just agencies that are going to be affected, but that's every end client as well. Mm which means that end clients at the moment are able to look at their candidate databases, find candidates. If they're, if they're uh, 
by what I can see, applying the law, their databases will go cut, bang, gone. Well, do you know I see... They more, won't have them. For me, it's so more they're gonna, about so opportunity for social. Yeah, because... So, yeah, exactly. So job boards are back. Can mm. the databases on a job board back? Any sort of social media to activate candidates is everything moving forwards because you won't have a candidate database in the way that you've got now. And it also means that agencies are going to, like, they can headhunt people, you know, are in really, really good shape. So it might mean that direct sourcing becomes so much more difficult than it is at the moment if you apply the law in a way that it has to be applied. Well, also, it, you know, because you don't just, I mean, how far can it go? Because at the end of the day, if I store someone's number in my phone, do I have to ask them permission? To yeah. have their number in my phone. Yeah. So, and I have to then text them every 12 months saying that. If they're a candidate or if you're using it for business purposes, there's. There is so, some, so, so from the, what yeah, I understand, let me just go into that. Let me just go into that. Business partner better but this is great. This is great. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because let me just say. By the way, take my phone number off your the, phone. I'm joking. The, 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 the point is. Is, <laughs> is that when I. Um, because recruitment agents are so good at building relationships. Mm. You're not a friend in you. You're not. You're not a, just a business transaction. You're actually a friend because you know about your candidates. Your top candidates. You best know. Best ones. Yeah, exactly. Best your best ones. ones. The best candidates. But you think know. about how many thousands of people applying for jobs that are held then on a database and moving forwards. It's great. Yeah. So imagine you're like a big retailer. Won't name names because I haven't talked to them. But let's say you're a big retailer and you hire for an IT professional. Mm-hmm. You don't go to that market very often, but you put a job advert out and you got a database. Two years later, you need the same skill set. At the moment, you can go back to that database and use it. Moving forward, if they haven't given consent, that database is gone. Yeah. You can't. You can't. It's fantastic because it means because you're always going to give consent to the platforms that you're on all the time. Mm. So, so LinkedIn probably wins. One, yeah, absolutely. Recruited twice. Yeah. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Stack Overflow, Kaggle, Quora, all, all these, these social sides, channels. They win. Because every time you log on, essentially you're giving your permission yes. that they can, and, it, and that that never expires. So that that for me, I'm getting really excited because Recruiter Social can um, cream so on you, that. You, you, Hold tight, the Tim Recruiter Social you, team. You, you you could be in an amazing position because it might become very difficult to source candidates directly, especially niche ones. Unless so you activate they, your brand constantly on social. Exactly. Because you need the consent. So let me come into this because I, I, I've got There's a couple of things. Nobody's talking about it. GDPR. So let's talk nobody's about this talking beautiful, about it. beautiful. Have you heard, I mean, have you heard that said anywhere? Before? Never, ever. I, it, but, but it's coming in two months. It's May. But, it's a law. But I've heard... No company's talked about it. So I heard... They must be doing... They I must heard that there's this. only two people accountable for um, looking... For, for basically policing GDPR. Two. Two. I heard it at one of your events, actually. Right. It's all like Chinese whispers, isn't not it? Me. <laughs> I didn't hear it from you. It's yeah. not you, obviously. Um, no. So let's actually. So it doesn't matter. Though. Ian. It doesn't matter if it's like Ian. saying it's like saying I'm not going to commit a crime because there's only three police people out there. It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like well, I could do. I could just go, like, go down the road and take the TV, but you're not going to do that, are you? Well, well, you shouldn't do that. Unless it's an apocalypse, then you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. Then, then, then I'm all. So for it doesn't it. matter about the size of the police force. It, it, it matters what the rules are. And you're telling me that X big FTSE 100 isn't going to apply the law and then gets found out. Like actually, you've not applied those. You've not applied those data laws. They can't do that. No, you're right. You're right. They can't do Listen, it. Listen, I want to talk about something. GDPR. Mm. This is what Ian said. So I was like, because I. By the way, my legal team know about GDPR and they're making sure that recruiting is ready for it. But to me, I'm like, it's not really fun. So I'm like, well, <laughs> just make sure that the site is ready for it, I, yeah. and and you guys do that. But. So GDPR sounds boring, but it's going to be mental. It means it's ev- impact. It's it means impact, every yeah. single one of us can sell the data we create. What about from my personal perspective then? I can actually sell my own data. I'm not buying your data. No, obviously. I've got your number. But what I'm no, but no, but like the point is, is that it, the power of personal brand. Yes. So, if theoretically, well, no, not theoretically. When GDPR kicks in, yeah, as a personal brand. And I create a lot of data. Yeah. I create a lot of traction. I yeah. create a lot of people looking at my posts. I, I, I actually take all of my... So I get like an average about 1.2 million uh, views a month on LinkedIn now. Really? Yeah, which is great. It's probably the hairstyle. Yeah, well, hairstyle, all the um, nonsense that I put out. Um, but I get an average about that. But that tells me about there's a certain type of community, what they like, and I can start segmenting them down. Mm. I'm creating that data. Yes. I own that data. Now I could actually go and sell that to someone. I won't because I'll just have it myself. 
but I wouldn't sell names, wouldn't sell anything. All I'm selling is preferences. Yeah. So the beautiful I thing about well, this... I don't know. I don't know if you can sell it. Well, it creates but, a but, whole new business. But, creates... look, for sure, you are... If you own data moving forwards, you're even a more powerful position. Because at the moment, anybody's got data because they can get it. They can, like, you know, go into something and say, give me your data, and they get it. But when it's regulated, it's, it's, it's harder to get that data and it's harder to keep it. So if you have it, which you do, and you will have then you're in a more powerful position, I think. Yeah, but you, you have to have permission, obviously. Yes. But in terms of... Uh, by the way, I don't know if this is true. I'm just This is just what my team is telling me. Okay, play me in, yeah. So, um, and also, like, like I said, it does create a whole new marketplace because I don't own the data. So now you're going to have sort of like, rather than one... So they say that data is... The new, the the modern day oil, the twenty first century oil. You know, <laughs> that's what they say. said. That? Well, that's what they say out there. They data do. Is oil. They do. I like that. Data is oil. <laughs> that's so a great. You could coin that. Yeah, but no, I don't coin it. I mean, this is something that I. I like saw. that though. Data is oil. Yeah. So it's a modern day oil, right? Yeah. So those who have True. access to data, like yeah. for instance, EE, mm. they have loads of phones, yeah. right? But they actually sell the, the the traffic of people to the people at Waze and the, the um, companies that do the G, GP, GPS, whatever, you know, mm. the, the, the mapping. Yeah. So they sell that data. And yeah. also there's another, there's other companies, but they can't do that anymore, which is amazing. Well, it's going to change a lot of things. So, yeah. so it means that I can monetize my own data, you know, like, like it's, it's basically putting the power into people's hands, but at the same time, from a business point of view, it's probably a bit scary. Mm. So how is your, how's your agency, how, is you, how have you guys adapted to this GDPR Basically, stuff? my business partner, Nigel, spent the last three months thinking about this and cultural change and everything else that's going to come with it. Because you've got, you got to be ready, right? So, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time basically thinking and applying. Do you feel like it's a bit like the um, Y2K bug? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, because I know that no matter how good our processes are, that there's going to be somebody out there, which happened before when those discrimination laws came in, mm. that's going to look for an advert or claim or see something and claim, you know, that they didn't give consent or whatever. So they could like we could have their data and we could have like an email from them saying we can you consent or whatever. They could still say I didn't give you consent, and then it's like lit- it could be litigious. Yeah. So it wor- it does worry me that people are going to just try and throw a claim out there and say if this is a European data law. Yeah. What does it mean for Brexit? Because obviously we're leaving. Yeah. Doesn't mean anything. We're we're we're, we're bound by it. Um, but the thing is, right? It's already in place in Germany. So mm-hmm. we trade in Germany. It's already been. It's already under jurisdiction. In fact, you know, it's probably more profound in Germany because you know the German culture. They take data very seriously. Mm. And yet, you know, I think in six years of trading in Germany, we've only ever had one complaint. Um, so yeah, you're bit. You're right. It might. Hopefully, it is like Y two K. And everybody's like gets well, a lot, set up. And a lot of it's... consultants made a lot of money at this. We're a uh, GDPR well, consultant. Oh, me, you probably like had calls yourself. I must get like an email twice, three, four times a day about GDPR. Yeah. You know, it's like, are you ready? And apparently, sixty. I'm just like shut up. Sixty percent of consultants, sixty percent of companies out there haven't done anything about it. Yeah. So you well, know, absolutely. I think you absolutely certainly need to be um, about it. But you need a good team around you to make sure that that's happening. If 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 you're like me and you're like actually, I'm, I just find I find it a bit boring. Mm. I'm not really gonna pay my attention. You have but to have I'm, a policy. You, you know, probably need exactly. some sort of something needs to wear a data hat. So if something has yeah. to be taken off your database. Absolutely. You can affect do it very efficiently. If they have to see the data, Absolutely. then you can show them that very quickly. That's, that's right. the key thing. So what other recruitment game changing things do you think are going to happen going forward? Now, I think we talk about. We've spoken about a lot today, but what do you think? You know, ten years down the line, what, what do you think? What, what do you think the recruitment industry is going to look like? Well, I do think that people like Microsoft and uh, Google will have a big impact on the industry. Like, and I know people at those firms. I try and like get them to give me some sort of insight, and they're quite coy about it. Um, but you know, Microsoft owning LinkedIn is a big thing. Mm. Like, I heard that very shortly that when you go and open your Word document that down the right-hand column you'll be suggested jobs from mm. LinkedIn. And you can imagine what will happen as well. Like, let's imagine in five years' time or in two years' time, you're sat there on your computer, and instead of having an in-mail pop up from a recruiter, it'll be like a little video screen will pop up with mm. the recruiter saying, hi, can we talk? 
or even a more automated version of that. I mean, I saw some of your tech. I don't know which one of you did it, but like you know that uh, that that uh, gen thing, that oh, automated yeah. thing that does um, the lead, lead gen. gen. Yeah. I mean, that's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, but I think that, I, that sort of things coming. The automation of. I'm not being funny, but what? I mean, if okay, so I'll say this right now, and I'll call it. If link, if Microsoft, LinkedIn, whatever you want, whoever you want to call it, what entity, if they release something like that in the next ten years, I'll eat my my hat because, and I'll eat a hat. I'll actually eat a hat because I don't. Fi- well, let's say five years because maybe because things move so fast. But I don't think that they were that innovative to basically put in a word doc where you get started start getting suggested jobs. I just don't think they're that innovative. Yeah, but it, but it's autumn, But it's but think about it, right? You go on LinkedIn right now, down the right-hand side, you get suggested stuff, adverts. Yeah, but that, requi- based on that your requires that requires LinkedIn. And they suggest jobs for you. But then, so they just transfer that into Microsoft Word. But it would need to be a web-based... Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying that I just don't think I it's heard it's happen. coming this year. But what, would, what, but what would... But stuff like that, what would stop it happening? But it, but well, even, I just think the idea... But even more profound, right? But if it doesn't, great. Imagine you're on your, like, your little laptop and then up pops a little like thing from a recruiter saying, hi, can you talk? I want to have a chat with you about a role. Yeah. What's, what's stopping that happening? Rather than an in-mail, a little video, and it's like a guy, mm. you know, he's there, suited and booted. Hello. <laughs> you know, I'm headhunting on behalf of X. Let's have a chat. Yeah, that is good. That's going to happen, right? Where, when? It could happen now. Are you building it? No. Not yet. Be a good thing to build. Exactly. Maybe we could build it into recruited. You in could. Future. Interesting. What, what, so, okay, from a experience point of view, so do you think that all interaction is going to happen online rather than a telephone in the future? Do you think in the future you won't have telephones? Uh, just be you, always gonna, you, you can always have telephones, aren't you, I think. You're going to have some sort of mobile device thing mm. which might also be your computer so it's more likely that laptops go and it becomes a bigger mobile yeah. mo- more integrated but i think you know i think we're as far as it will go from that perspective because you don't there's only a certain size of thing you want in your pocket mm. and you're going to have that close to you yeah um but i think people will be accessing and they already are you probably got stats better than i do about how people apply through mobile now yeah in a way that they never used to so it's massive right already so 95 percent of job applications are done through mobile is that right 95 percent, and I'll, we'll put the stats in the uh in is the, that right it's exactly right yeah 95 percent. this is literally a study done by linkedin um uh, a uh, a month ago, but yeah, ninety five percent of their job applications. By the way, their job applications are yeah. done from mobile. Really? Yeah. It seems high, but well, but anyway, it's getting higher for definite. It's easy apply, it? Well, it's easy to apply. That's it. So you just apply with you just do one click ap- application. So I'll, we'll put the data yeah. in the uh, YouTube link anyway. Well, it's all coming anyway. That sort of stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about. Um, Recruited. Mm. So, as, as I said at the start, you were one of the first, well, the first person who invested in Recruited. Yeah. And so, why did you do that? Uh, <laughs> so, why did, yeah, because, uh, good question. No, honestly, honestly, <laughs> why did you do it? And I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an interesting one to me because, you know, you enabled this to happen. You've enabled this to happen, you know. So, w- w- why? I thought it was a great idea. As I said to you earlier, you know, um, like you said, I don't think there's anything else like it. I don't think there's a home for recruitment experience. Mm. Um, you know, the you, you know you talked about making things accountable in the recruitment process. So for candidates and for clients to be able to see transparently who the best is, what it looks like, I think it needs to happen. So I thought it was a, a great idea, um, and you know I really like the look and feel of what you were what you mm. were doing even at that sort of early stage. Uh, and I thought it'd be fun. Yeah. You know, and I like I like uh, being involved with things that, you know, I think have legs and mileage to innovate. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was, I saw, saw it. I was t- typing away, as I told you, in my boxes. Yeah. You know, one Saturday morning. I saw know. It flicking through and I saw it on LinkedIn or somewhere. And I thought, that's really cool. So I sent you that message to say, it'd be good to have a chat. And where do you think recruited will be in sort of like a year's time? Well, mate, I mean. As a board member. <laughs> Who knows, which is a really exciting thing because what you've done in the first year already is exceptional really for most startups. But, mm. um, you know, the different ideas that are there could genuinely make 
a massive difference could own not only industry but be mm. right at the center of the industry mm. so who knows which is good right yeah. if i was saying it's going to be like x 100k whatever yeah. next year be like okay that's cool take it but it literally it could go tangential it could take off yeah. it could be they could be absolutely massive but then it's you know it it's a big thing that you're trying to launch this social platform to get everybody basically onto the site that's mm. not easy yeah that that's the hardest thing it's really impressive what you've done well it wouldn't be possible without you so thanks thanks a lot for that james really appreciate it mate um great really really entertaining conversation i, I really really uh, enjoyed it i think anytime we get together it's always a good conversation to record this is even better so thanks very much for coming on the show james Pleasure, mate. um i really appreciate it for you guys out there who want to know a bit more about james just there's a couple of links down below um so click on them look at the btn it's a it's a great initiative you know it's very successful and it's helped us out a lot you know being a social media agency too so there is so much value within um what they're doing um thanks a lot james cheers enjoy pleasure. enjoy your beer cheers mate <laughs> nice to thanks. see you cheers mate nice to see you too so thanks. for you guys out there please make sure that you subscribe to this channel if you want to see or hear this uh, type of content every single week. If you've got any comments on what we've said, then make sure you comment down below. Um, we have a number of uh, great guests coming on the show in the future. Um, you know, we're talking about a couple of things. We're talking about the LGBT community in the workplace and how they feel. We're talking about um, more, bit more recruitment stuff. We're talking about how over being over fifty in the workplace feels. So there's a lot of great things that we're, we're sort of trying to tackle and trying to just open up a forum to. So please make sure you're commenting on the stuff. And if you've got any questions, if you've got any ideas around the people we should be contacting and getting on the show, then make sure that you uh, comment. But other than that, see you guys next week. Mondays, 12 p.m. GMT, a new episode every week.